We're here to empower high income earners to gain back control of your time through financial independence and stop trading your time for money and start letting your money work harder for you. And hey, if you want to meet other high income earners on their FIRE journey, join our high income earners FIRE Facebook group. Every month we'll have guest speakers and we'll share about what our team is currently working on and allow you to share what you are working on with other high income earners. So hello everyone, welcome back to the High Income Earner FIRE podcast. So today I have a very special guest and this is our second episode that we're filming in person. And thanks Judy for letting us film at your place. It's a very nice backdrop compared to our Zoom usual video. And the reason why I invited Judy is because first, um, she is financially freedom, <laughs> hit her financial freedom at age 53. But more important, she also uh, pledged a lot of her assets into charitable works that she holds dearly because she went through it herself and she has a lot of stories to share. And also on top of that, we don't have a lot of female guests on the show and and I'm really inspired by Judy's story. I think her story will, sh will inspire a lot of people. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Judy. Hi Cody, thank you very much for having me today. Yeah, so Judy uh, is already retired, um, but can you go back a little bit and tell us how you started because Judy has a very interesting background. She never took any business course, but she started her first business at 23 years old. So how did that happen? Um, I grew up in an industry uh, where my parents owned a company in the beauty supply industry. And uh, my mother worked with my father for 22 years. So my role model was a woman who was strong uh, woman. a strong woman in business. Yeah. And uh, um, Anyway, at the age of 22, I had graduated. I was teaching high school on a part-time basis, trying to figure out what to do with my life. Nice. Uh, uh, started skydiving uh, when I was- uh, Instructor? Uh, no, not an instructor, but I okay. have 117 parachute jumps, which I made when I was very young. And uh, frankly, uh, the only so time- So like, uh, you like to chase those hikes. Exactly, exactly. Right. I have a little bit of an adrenaline junkie uh, yeah. in me. But um, at the age of 22, I took a job with an American hair care company that was Dallas-based. And uh, the reason I took that job was because they promised to uh, make me their exclusive Canadian distributor mm -hmm. after six months of working in the States. And as it turned out, it was 11 and a half months later, but I did become their exclusive Canadian distributor. And mm -hmm. at the age of 23, I started my business with that brand and really never looked back. Uh, took on numerous other brands, and over the course of my uh, career, I represented anywhere from 35 to 40 American companies exclusively in Canada, where I was responsible for warehousing the product, uh, carrying the receivables, hiring the sales force, and doing all the marketing. And uh, my company grew pretty rapidly from the start, but it was very different being a woman in business in those days. That was the early 70s. I remember you said it. And one of the bio you sent me, you said a woman in business like standing on the 10 feet pole? Is that 10 foot hole. 10 foot hole, yeah. hole, okay. Hole, yeah. <laughs> uh, wh why do you say that? Like um, much more so in those days than today. Uh, my customers were 95% men. And um, but it's a beauty product. It's it doesn't hairs. matter. The men, okay. the men that ran those companies, uh, the men that I called on that were my customers, my competitors were men. And the women that held jobs in those days uh, were predominantly uh, hair color technicians, uh, salespeople on the road, but they weren't in executive positions. So I fully felt that business was a sport and um, it was a man's game or sport in those days. And I was very athletic, so I understood understood sports, yeah. and uh, I figured if I wanted to play in that arena, it was their bat, their bases, their ball, I had to learn how to play the game. Mm -hmm. And so I would invariably feel when I met someone that I was in a 10 foot hole and I had three to five seconds to, prove yourself. to just get level, to get on yeah. the level playing and field. how do you do that? Everything from a handshake, eye contact. Yeah. Uh, I had a very firm handshake, so invariably somebody shaking my hand would make a comment about how firm my handshake was, look me in the eye, yeah. and uh, I was all business. I dressed for business, and uh, uh, I, I was all business in those days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely a lot of things changed now. Yeah, very much but, so. Uh, I, I wish I met you back then to just see and admire <laughs> how, how you operate. Uh, and 
So you took on that job at 23, but you're kind of entrepreneur already, having the promise that you will take over the whole uh, exclusive offering right. at age 23. And then, and then how did it go on from there? Uh, so my customers in the Canadian market at that time were beauty supply wholesalers. And interestingly enough, my parents' original company was a customer of mine for 30 years. Oh, really? Okay. So the salesmen that watched me grow up were my, um, they, they were a customer. And uh, Was it a help or do you think it's not a help? Um, I think they <laughs> weren't sure whether I was going to take this business seriously. Yeah. And uh, what they found out very shortly Thereafter was that I was incredibly serious, very driven, very passionate, and uh, um, you know became quite successful early on. Yeah, and what was driving you? Because your parents has a business, for lack of better words, you don't have to do much mm -hmm. and ride it through all your life. So mm -hmm. what was driving you, and why were you so different in that case? Because while everyone's enjoying the nightclubs life, early twenties you know, dating and all that. Why yeah. were you so driven? Uh, I think it's a common characteristic of entrepreneurs. Um, I mention often that uh, uh, an image that I, I uh, had explained to me early on in my career was that uh, we are always searching for the horizon. We're, we're going for the horizon. And of course, we never achieve a goal we, we, because the horizon continues moving. Yeah, we can never worry. get there. Yeah. Um, I was very driven by fear of failure. Mm -hmm. um, the, the agreement that I signed with this American company was a three-year contract. Mm -hmm. And in the first year, I had to purchase $120,000 US in the, that very short. There were only six products, hair care products. And... Um, you know, at that time, if I had $1,000 in the bank, I was comfortable. Uh, I didn't know any better. Um, wow. I, I was independent from the time I was 15 or 16. I yeah. always had part-time jobs. I worked through university. Mm -hmm. Although I didn't have to, I did. And mm -hmm. um, I think that entrepreneurial, sp entrepreneurial spirit came from my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that's very inbred. And um, when I think about that initial or opening order that I had to place, it was thirty or forty thousand dollars U.S. and uh, was it scary? It was feeling? terrifying for me. And that's like what? How long ago was that? I was twenty-three. I was nineteen seventy-three. So that's <clears throat> a different thirty or one hundred twenty thousand dollars today. Yeah. That might mean is more of a half, half a million. million. Yeah, today. yeah. It was an enormous number, and uh, uh, again, I, I had a huge fear of failure, and most entrepreneurs. Uh, won't admit to that, yeah, that, that drives buy it them. Up, and now you have to you have sell, to sell it. it. I have to pay. I, well, the good news is I, I figured this out quite early. I had 90 days to pay my bills. And because what I had, you couldn't buy from anyone else in Canada, that once I created a business for a customer of mine, whether it was Vancouver or Newfoundland, uh, 30 days after you purchased that product, if you hadn't paid your receivable on 31 days, I wouldn't ship you. So I learned that lesson very early that a sale is not a sale until you get paid. Yeah. So my receivables were always current. And as I said, I had 90 days to pay the Dallas-based company for my product. But uh, uh, an expression I heard years ago about entrepreneurs is that we are egomaniacs with an insecurity complex, <laughs> which uh, is a very, uh, I think, accurate way to describe me. I, again, I would say most entrepreneurs may not admit to that, but uh, it's a pretty common thread. Yes, it's, we're definitely a special breed. Mm -hmm. We're a special breed. We push everything down. We try to handle everything. Right. We don't know what's going really going through down here, but up here we're smiling, right? Um, so how did that like, have a success early on, able to buy a product for half a million, push it all out in 120 days or 90 days? How did that success impact you? Did you start expanding from there because you saw a confidence that mm -hmm. you could do it? Mm -hmm. And then you went up from there, is that? Well, uh, for the first seven years I was in business, my business was with beauty supply wholesalers across Canada, who in turn sold my products to salons. So um, if you went to get a haircut, they might put a cape around you to keep you dry. Uh, they might use a pair of scissors I imported, a shampoo I imported. So many of the products used or retailed through salons came from me. But you as a consumer would not know Who that I was the initial yeah. master distributor and importer mm -hmm. of those items. Mm -hmm. At the end of my seventh year, uh, I traveled to American conferences looking for new products all the time. 
And at the end of my seventh year, I was found that I, I had numerous items that couldn't bear all the markups going through me to a wholesaler, yeah. to a salon, to a consumer. And so I started a second division selling to people like Shoppers Drug Mart, Walmart, uh, Loblaws, people like that across Canada. And that division over the course of my business career became 10 times the size of the first division. So basically at first you were selling to the wholesaler, you rely on the volume, mm -hmm. right? A small profit margin, but you found that, hey, a lot of end user have to go through all that. So why not you start a second division to sell directly to them? They get a better price, you get a better profit margin mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. That's why you started the second division. Mm -hmm. And you say that business was 10 times bigger? The, si the size of the first division. How big of a team did you have? Like so I had uh, um, a warehouse always north of the city, at the north end of the city. Um, I was in uh, 21,000 square feet uh, for about 17 years in Markham at wow. Warden and Steeles. Wow. Uh, I employed 25 people internally. Uh, that was office staff and warehouse staff. I didn't do any manufacturing or filling in my warehouse at that time, but I would kit product. So I would, I would buy different components, boxes, caps, lids, um, and raw materials, have those products manufactured for me or contract manufactured, and we would put them together in my warehouse. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a national sales force in my retail division of 35 to 40 people, depending on uh, the year, mm -hmm. and uh, those were commissioned people. Um, and in my professional salon division, I had five people on the road covering Canada. Just like uh, salespeople. Salespeople. Making sure your customers are happy. Exactly, right? exactly. And there was a lot of education in the professional salon division. Uh, we well. worked a lot of conventions. Uh, hairdressers and, and stylists don't work on Sunday and Monday. So my conventions were, I would arrive in a city on a Saturday, set up my booth, do my sales meetings, and the convention would be Sunday, Monday. And then Tuesday for me would feel like a Saturday. Yeah. And uh, I would travel on to the next city. And uh, it wasn't unusual for me to fly from Toronto to Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Toronto, do all of those cities in maybe 10 days, 11 days. And um, and that's around early, kind of your late 20s, early, early 30s. 30s, yes. That's yes. around my age. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's where you have to drive energy to Exactly, do that. exactly. And so is it fair to say your first division maybe about 20 people, second division 100 people? Under you. No, no. You, you t well, it, from the standpoint of salespeople, I had 35 salespeople wow. in the retail division. Wow. Um, and uh, I employed 25. So uh, my staff was, you know, 25 plus 30, pardon me, plus five people in sales. And my retail sales force was a commission sales force. So I didn't employ those people. They were on straight commission. So if they wrote a, a lot of business, yeah. they earned a lot of money if they didn't write a lot of business. And so unlike some owners, I, the bigger the commission checks I signed, the happier I was. Because if they were making money, I was making money. Yeah, yeah totally get it. Like for people who doesn't know, like admin people and office people and sales people are totally different mm -hmm. beasts, right? So if you want to... Hire salespeople, you gotta treat them accordingly. The more they make, the more you make kind exactly. of thing. And, but exactly. admin people is totally different, so you gotta know how to tell the difference. Exactly. Um, so where do you learn all this? How big was your parents' company compared to yours? Uh, so my sales were about seven times what my father's company was doing. And do you think looking growing up in that environment help you? Absolutely. Okay. Our, our dinner table conversation was not what did you study in school today. It was which salon was, you know, their, which, which receivable was in arrears or what salon were they building. Um, it was very much business oriented in my house growing up. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That, that yeah. definitely helps. Not that it's a must, but mm -hmm. growing up that kind of environment definitely drive you who you are, were back then. Mm -hmm. Um, I had sales jobs at 12. I was selling uh, shirts, uh, T-shirts. Uh, I had a paper route when I was 11. Uh, I was working at a stable because I wanted to be around horses when I was 12. So I, I always seemed to have jobs. And when my friends were traveling through Europe, I was working. And that's just who I was. Mm -hmm. And you were comfortable in that? Totally, totally. And would you say you're a rare breed among your friends, oh, female, uh, yes. driven entrepreneurs who manage so many people. I, I would say that um, given where I grew up in Toronto and the school system I went through, 
I was a rarity for sure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And I know you had early on success. You run first division, very successful. Have the second division, and. I remember on your bio, you told me that you actually, try, when you try to expand, you pick up a, a U.S. company that was basically losing $250,000 per month. So tell us more about that story. So when I was 36, um, there was a company based in New York that I had represented for 15 years. I was their exclusive Canadian distributor. They manufactured the premier brand of hair removal wax used in salons mm -hmm. really around the world. And um, I acquired that company first, and the second company I was a competitor of. And um, so I knew the brand very, very well. And uh, we wanted a, the, a division of the second company. And because it was in, the parent company was in financial trouble, we had to acquire the parent company. Why were they in financial trouble if they're uh, your very competitor? Very severe mismanagement by the prior owner. Uh, mm -hmm. Very severe mismanagement. And, um, so to acquire the, the division, we had to buy the parent company, and uh, uh, they owed uh, about $10 million US, um, a, a few million to a couple of banks, uh, about a million and a half dollars to the customers, which was really rare. Uh, they owed that in co-op monies that weren't paid, returns that weren't credited. That was the parent company, and uh, the division. So you have to take over all that. We had to take over all of that. So how did that work? I know, I, you know, I know a little bit. I know it's probably you can talk about this because yeah. it already happened, right? Yeah. So if they owe ten million, mm -hmm. how much do you have to pay? So we how we did that work? we had to hire. First of all, we filed a Chapter Eleven in the Brooklyn Bankruptcy Court. Yeah. We had a bankruptcy attorney and. Um, um, so I, I, my Canadian company, we had a number of U.S. companies in between my Canadian company and the company that was in trouble so that my Canadian company was safe. Yeah. And um, what we had to do was we had to make a deal with the creditors. We made a deal with the banks to reduce what we owed them by millions. Um, the creditors took 10 cents on the dollar. And the reason that they accepted only 10 cents on the dollar uh, that's not the customers, but the creditors, people like freight companies, packaging companies, um, raw material companies. Uh, the reason that they took that 10 cents on the dollar was because they got to retain a customer, that we were going to maintain that the division and, mm -hmm. and remain a customer to those people. So if they hadn't voted to agree to that 10 cents on the dollar, they would have lost a customer and lost everything. So here they got 10 cents on the dollar and the money they were owed, plus they continued to, to have a customer that, on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Um, with the customers, people like Rite Aid, uh, Revco, um, Eckert Drugs, Long Drugs, mm -hmm. uh, Thrifty Drugs, mm -hmm. uh, every drug chain in America was owed money by the parent company. Mm -hmm. And so the plan we came up with uh, was every six months for two years, that drug chain could buy from us free goods, uh, make their margin and make their profit, uh, and get back 100 cents on the dollar that they were owed. So if we owed Walgreens, which we did, about $240,000, they, they continued to do business with us, which we needed, of course. That's brilliant. And they then, every six months, got to shop for products that they carried where they would make their margin and they would get back uh, 100 cents on the dollar over a two-year period. So we didn't lose any customers, which was truly that remarkable. Is brilliant. Because yeah. you don't have to pay out of your pocket. Yeah. But you let them make money, also mm -hmm. pay for your own debt, exactly. and you still keep the customer happy. Mm -hmm. Exactly, brilliant. yeah, it was a great plan. That was brilliant. Yeah, and we were out of Chapter 11 in 15 months, which was unheard of in the Brooklyn yeah. Bankruptcy Court, apparently. It, yeah, they, you it, helped it them was, out. You saved a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, we, we did, and um, we saved the company. And about a year later, so we were profitable within four or five months, and um, what I had to do was call on all these retailers and say, my name is Judy Wells. I'm a woman. I'm Canadian. So I had like three strikes against me. And uh, yes, I know we owe you $200,000. But yeah. if you remain a customer and your, your uh, receivable is current, uh, we will get you 100 cents on the dollar. And um, it was a very, very difficult year and a half for me. Very difficult. And uh, uh, I'm very proud of what we were able to do. And is that, like we're gonna take a small pivot point here. Is that 
why you have early on success and have to deal with all these things at age 36. Deal with almost bankrupt company taking over, forced to take over their parent company and try to turn around, come up with an innovative deal that never anyone come up with, make it work. Does that have anything to do with kind of you're trying to find another way you keep pushing these pressure down as an entrepreneur and start finding other substance to help you out? Is that where the where it all started or? You're talking about my drinking? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it's drinking or something else, but is that like, when do you start this drinking thing? Where's yeah. how they all started? Yeah, well, I, I would say that in university, I was never a social drinker. Um, I always drank a lot, but uh, during this period of time, uh, I was married. Um, my ex-husband and I are dear friends today. Uh, he was my greatest cheerleader through this period. And um, um, I, I drank a lot. And uh, Starting in university already. Yeah, but it didn't become... Party drinker, you're a partier. Uh, somewhat. Okay. Uh, but it didn't become problematic, I would say, until my, my mid to late 30s. And the pressure and stress of these two U.S. companies. So I was pretty much on the road in the States for two years. And my Canadian company was being run by an executive that I had at the time, mm -hmm. although I had set parameters so nobody could blow up the business in Canada. Yeah. Uh, I, a bit of a micromanager. Uh, you could have yeah, to, right? When you're first yeah. gen, you start as your baby, right? Exactly, exactly. But uh, it uh, certainly, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur with certain, you know, major levels of stress, uh, um, drinking helped me just turn my head off. It just helped me turn, my brain was going all the time. And it, it was really a relief and, uh, you know, to have a few drinks. It just sort of... Take a deep breath and try to chill. Wow. So, do you mind if I ask, like, at what stage you kind of got married and was the reason why you started drinking or being successful in business any part of the reason for, you know, you guys separate ways and all that? Do you think it's because you're very strong mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe sometimes perceived as an overpowering mm -hmm. woman, like, and, and then that's kind of lead to that? Would you say, any of those things could be a reason or a reason for for like for the separation oh, and all that um I, I would say you know in a very loving way we had just come to the end of our our path together mm -hmm. and um um again we're my ex is remarried we're very dear friends today and um i'll leave it at that gotcha <laughs> gotcha so you were heavy drinker, but you were still running the two yeah. companies. Mm -hmm. You were holding it down. Three companies. Three companies. Two in the U.S., one yeah, in Canada. Canada, yeah. So, why was it a problem? Why do you keep drinking? Mm -hmm. When uh, did it become a problem? I would say uh, at the age of 40, um, uh, my marriage had ended. The businesses, I was now back in the Canadian company. I had sold off the U.S. company successfully, and um, my drinking had escalated. And um, what I've come to learn is that uh, alcoholism is a disease, it's a family disease, and um, you have, or one has, I had, an obsession and compulsion to drink that overrode everything. And um, I, I would say that the stress exacerbated that, but that I uh, was born an alcoholic waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, at the age of 41, I got sober, and I've been sober since then. So what was that turning point? How do you go from, how much were you drinking at most? Oh. Like, can you kind of put us in context here? <laughs> um, so typical for me, I could have two martinis before dinner, a bottle of wine with dinner, and drinks after dinner. Um, at the end of my drinking career, I was drinking alone. Um, if I passed out or blacked out, I was a very high-functioning blackout drinker, Cody. What does that mean? It means that I could um, get on a plane, uh, get off the plane, get my luggage, uh, get into a cab, go to a hotel, check into the hotel, and come out of the blackout unpacking in my hotel, which happened to me at a conference in Las Vegas. I had no recollection of anything that happened to me from the time I got on the flight in Chicago on my way to Las Vegas. 
um, from the time I got on the plane to the time I was unpacking my hotel, hotel suite, absolutely no recollection of anything that happened. And um, that is termed a blackout. And I had dozens and dozens of blackouts during my drinking career. So when I quit drinking, or by the time I was ready to quit drinking, uh, if I passed out and left, you know, two or three ounces of straight Russian vodka in a glass beside my bed, if I woke up at six in the morning or eight in the morning, it occurred to me that the right thing to do was to drink that vodka, go to my freezer, open the freezer door and, and have the bottle of vodka and be drinking first thing in the morning. And um, uh, I, I never went anywhere without alcohol. Uh, I always had a bottle of vodka in my purse. Uh, at the time, I was a very heavy smoker. I had cigarettes and, and vodka and wouldn't rely on anyone for either of those two things. And uh, my life had become very small. And uh, I was not only a daily drinker, but there were days that I was drunk twice in one day where I could drink in the morning, uh, recognize that I was way too messed up to go to work. And, um, you know, my office was in Markham, so sometimes I would get within two or three blocks of the office. I lived at St. Clair and Young at the time, so yeah. I had a, you know, up the Don Valley Parkway, inebriated. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be two or three blocks from the office, look in the rearview mirror, recognize that I was way too messed up to go to work. And it would occur to me the right thing to do was to go to the liquor store on Highway 7, go north on... Uh, Kennedy Road somewhere. Uh, I had a huge four-door Mercedes at the time. Park the car, lock the doors, put the seat back, pass out, and I might be there sleeping for two or three hours. You know, come to, drive back downtown and start drinking again. So uh, my life was very small. I wasn't drinking with anyone. I drank alone. I drank daily. Um, and I couldn't stop. So I tried to change what I drank. I, I, I tried scotch, I tried white wine spritzers, nothing worked. I, I always ended up back to vodka. Wow. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I did a little cocaine in my time. I never did very much of it because I didn't really like the, the, that feeling. It was always cut with something. And the good news is I didn't like it because uh, yeah. I could have afforded to do a lot of it. Yeah, and lots you're wealthy of, enough to do yeah, any damage yes, to your body. That's exactly you right. And yeah. uh, lots of high net worth people, you know, can afford to do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, my drug of choice was Russian vodka. Mm -hmm. And uh, I woke up one day and uh, um, I had a 1939 Jaguar kit car at the time that was mounted on a 1974 Mustang chassis. Mm -hmm. So it was a very light car uh, on a big engine. And I drove that drunk to the cottage, which is 50 miles north of Toronto, and um, got up the next morning at my parents' cottage and I had a Mickey of vodka, which I drank warm at 8.30 yeah. that morning and was newly drunk. At, by nine o'clock in the morning, I was drunk. And my sisters, their children, and my parents were there and uh, uh, I had driven on the very road that my brother was killed on and I was out of control. And um, drove back to the city at 10 o'clock in the morning quite drunk. And that week my older sister called me to her house and she said, I'm not going to lose another sibling to alcohol, you need help. And she had called a couple of treatment centers and you have to call yourself. You, the person with the problem has to make that call. And uh, I went So home. they know, your family knows. My family knew very well that I had a problem. But did they try to... They didn't up until that point. Uh, I think there, there often there is sort of denial in the family or, you know, I kept it pretty well hidden for the most part, but uh, uh, that morning it was evident I was not hungover. I was newly drunk. And um, I went home that night, I had a few drinks, and I called the treatment center, and um, uh, the man who answered the phone said, have you been drinking? And I had that moment of clarity where I knew I couldn't lie anymore. I used to lie to my GP about how much I drank. I, I lied to everyone about how much I drank. And that night, I knew that it was time to just tell the truth, and uh, I did. And I ended up in that treatment center three weeks later, and um, I've been sober ever since. Do you mind, like, because I've never been in a treatment center, like, what does it entail in the treatment center? What do they do in there? <laughs> well, you, <laughs> you're, you, you're laughing, I'm laughing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, the counselors were all in recovery, which is a big deal because they know where you've been, they okay, know where you are, they Overcome have lived it. experience, and they've okay. overcome it. 
that's critically important to the, the to my story yep. and, and to the treatment As center I was in. We don't trust anyone who has never exactly. been there, done that. We're exactly. Like, yes. Right. And the counselor that I had, um, you know, had read my bio and knew that I was successful. And her job was to find out how serious I was about getting sober. Yeah, how serious. You know, was and that? and it, was I just taking up a seat or was I serious? Yeah. And I. Were you serious? I was dead serious. I, I didn't want to die. I didn't want to hurt anyone else. I'm very fortunate I didn't hurt anyone drinking and driving. Yeah, I don't know about. I don't know if that's a gift or that's a curse for yeah. you. Being able to function at blackout and not do anything bad to yourself or anyone mm, else. I mm. don't know if that's a gift or. Well, uh, you know, I, I, it, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I sometimes think my brother's number was up and mine wasn't. Uh, very fortunate that I didn't hurt anyone drinking and driving. And, um, but they, they take their sobriety very seriously. Uh, um, they did there. And um, you, you do a lot of work on your inner child, on yourself, on understanding what the underlying problem is, problem is What's the cost, right? and and why was I drinking? Why did I start drinking? And um, um, you know how serious I am, serious I am about staying sober. And it's a one day at a time thing. Like I, all I know is I'm going to sleep tonight without alcohol. I have no idea what I'll do tomorrow. So I don't have to think about the rest of my life. I never had to think about that. It's one day at a time. Is it at their facilities? Or Sorry? Was it at their facilities? Mm -hmm. At their accommodation? Right. You stay there so they can monitor you? Sure. Is that, is that how it yes, goes? Yes, yes. And how yeah. long was that? I was there 28 days. 28 days. Yeah, wow. yeah. Was it tough in the beginning? Withdraw was there any withdrawal uh, With symptoms? me, uh, you know, well, you it's different it for everyone. No, I, I had no major withdrawal. Um, and the obsession and compulsion to drink was virtually lifted within 48 hours. It's never come back. So I'm one of the few um, that I, I have no desire to have a drink. I don't ever want to go back to that life. I don't ever want to have that. It's like a switch. It, it was. It's like a switch. You were on, yeah. fully on, and yeah. you were fully off. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I believe, and, and you hear this phrase, I hit the bottom that I needed to hit for me, given where I was, my values, my standards. It would have taken me years to blow up my company. You know, it was a mature organization. It was 18 years old at the time. And, um, you know, I, I just did not want to live that way any longer. And I wanted to change and I wanted help. And as a, an independent, willful individual, like people think, well, don't you have willpower and can't you stop drinking? Nothing to do with willpower. I have all the willpower. Yeah, I like you prove Huge it. reserves of willpower. But I, I hit the bottom that I needed to hit and uh, I, I never want to go back there. I, I'm sufficiently terrified of, of the thought of going back to alcohol. Mm -hmm. And it's a progressive disease. So if I started to drink tomorrow, I'm not going back to where I was at 18. I'm going back to where I was at 41. Very rapidly, my drinking would escalate to where I was uh, at the end of my drinking career. Mm -hmm. Drinking career. Mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely the first time I heard their story. Not the first time, but the first time I heard the full story. Last thing I had a quick intro of that. Um, so... Now that you've been sober for 30 years and, you know, um, I know that you you start because of all your history, what you've gone through, how you overcome, you said you want to give back in a way that means a lot, hold dearly to you. Is yeah. that how you start helping out Mount Sinai? Yes. Or how did that happen? So um, my, my doctor, my GP, um, is affiliated, or was, he's now retired, but was affiliated with Mount Sinai, and any specialist I ever had to see was at the hospital. So I was in and out of the hospital, uh, you know, frequently. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one day, I was walking by the donor wall, and uh, I thought, you know, it's time for me to give something that's more meaningful. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to give it to Mount Sinai. And, um, because I, they were helping you throughout they, the way. Because they, they had always helped me. And um, the doctors that I had past tense and have today mm -hmm. are at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first money that I committed to give, they asked where I wanted that money to go. 
and I really hadn't thought through. So you just I, want to give back, but you I don't know where. To, I didn't know, know where. So I asked yeah. them, where do you need the money? And they were hoping, their labor, labor and delivery department was in the dark ages, and they were hoping to build six birthing rooms. And so my contribution, my initial contribution was to build one of those birthing rooms. Mm -hmm. And um, seven months later, I went back and I said, I'd like to do all six of them. And at, as a result of me stepping forward, the other five were committed. Mm -hmm. And you were um, like spearheading. Yeah. Everyone's waiting on you. Yeah, exactly. On that first exactly. Yeah. The first one. And um, Anyway, uh, I made a very, very substantial commitment that day, and uh, uh, they said, if you, if you make a donation of a certain amount, we will name the birthing center after you. So for about 15 years, it was called the Judy Walls Family Birthing Center, which I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. And every year, 4,500 to 5,000 babies were born in that birthing center. Mm -hmm. And Mount Sinai is known uh, as the place to go if you're a high risk, uh, mm -hmm. have a high risk pre pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And they've now torn down that birthing center. They built a much bigger one. There are 19 birthing rooms, and the first mm -hmm. six are in my name. So I'm still very proud of that. Wow. Wow. That's, um, that's just amazing. Mm -hmm. That's Thank just you. amazing. You achieve a lot when you're 23, s sold a company, and had this whole alcohol lizard throughout the way. At age 41, you're like, I need to st stop doing this. And then what happened after that? Did you like just, I know you kind of sold your company, the last one at age 53, that's where you call yourself financial free, right? That's why we stay true to our audience mm -hmm. here, right? So once you sold that, so all those uh, company and all that, do you still hold any of those? Or no, you, like, no, I'm totally so out. So what did you do? You don't have to tell me the amount. Mm -hmm. I know it was a big amount when you sell mm -hmm. the company. I can <laughs> go through the EBITDA. That's going through my brain. I know how to reverse it. Right. What do you do besides that like, pledging your donation to Mount Sinai right. and of course play golf, staying healthy now, never touch alcohol. What do you do with other money and maybe someone's in similar stages as you, mm -hmm. maybe a female might be a male, but right. what did you do that you learned throughout that? Like after 53, you, mm -hmm. all those money accumulated, where do you, how do you allocate those? Maybe you can share some lights for us. Um, so one thing I'm, I'm very proud of is I've been able to be um, very generous with my family. So that's where What do you mean by that, generous? In terms of your time, in terms of your money, your attention? What, what do you I mean would say that? over the years, I, I've been able financially to be very supportive um, to my family. Uh, I have no children that I know of. I always jokingly say that. <laughs> well, um, I mean. <laughs> so I, I have three nephews and uh, two sisters, and um, we're pretty close. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, that's one avenue that I've, I've been able to, uh, uh, and, and it's interesting with the hospital as well as my family, um, it does more for me to give than I, I always say this, it does more for me than for them. That um, if I weren't sober, I couldn't do any of this. So mm -hmm. I, I start with gratitude, mm -hmm. like, you know, how, Remarkable is it that I lived through those last years of mm -hmm. horrific drinking, that I, I, I didn't hurt myself. Uh, I did hurt myself, but I, I physically wasn't harmed, mm -hmm. and that I'm able to give back as a result of being sober. I, it's, it's where everything starts, that uh, I'm alive today because I'm sober. Mm -hmm. And um, so what else have I done? Uh, I've... Um, championed two programs at Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that I would talk about today I'm, I'm working on is a chair. It's the first in the world, mm -hmm. and certainly the first in Canada, a chair in the emergency department in addictions and mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that I'll share, and very often you, you have what's called a concurrent disorder. So I am an alcoholic, uh, I'm an addict, an alcoholic, uh, with bipolar disorder. So um, That's a very complex combination. combination. Yeah. So I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder five years after I quit drinking. And what you would uh, ordinarily hear is that until you take the substance away, until, so I was self-medicating for years. And what I, I thought, I'm a Libra, 
So Libras yeah, are the yeah. scale, my dad's a Libra. the balance. Yeah. And uh, so my system would be either very racy, very, very um, almost high with nothing, and mm. or I would be, you know, sort of semi-depressed and in a slow mood and not really feeling myself. And then I would flip again back and forth. And all the years that I drank, I cut off the highs and lows of that bipolar Stay your disorder. Own zone. You've so, your own zone. yeah. So it, the phrase self-medicating is what you would you would say I was doing. And five years into my sobriety, um, I had some. Uh, I had an opportunity during a physical with a, my GP, the same GP that I used to lie to when I drank. <laughs> you know, he would ask me how much I drank. I would say, oh, three or four drinks a day, but I wouldn't tell him each drink was six or eight ounces. <laughs> Um, so, um, I, I, he said to me at the end of a physical, how are you feeling? And now I'm five years sober. And I said, uh, well, half the time I have to explain to people, I can tell by their body language that they think I'm either on speed or cocaine, that I'm very racy and I talk really fast. And, mm -hmm. uh, so either I have to explain to them, I, I, this is just me. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. Uh, and the other half the time, I, I want a 22-wheeler on the 401 to roll over and put me out of my misery. And he said, oh, you're, at the time he used the phrase manic depressive, it's now called bipolar disorder. And uh, he wanted me to see a specialist, a psychiatrist. And uh, I said, I'm not seeing anyone, I'll fix this myself. And, and at the time I had a, a Testarossa, a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. And he said, Judy, if you run your... Testarossa on low test gas, on, on low grade gas, it's going to ping. And he reached over and he said, you're pinging, you need to see someone. <laughs> and um, I thought, I'm gonna fix this myself. And yeah, for a year, yeah. I tried very hard and uh, I, I finally uh, called him and I said, whoever you want me to see, I'm happy to see, I, I can't fix this. And because the longer I was sober, the more extreme the highs and lows highs and were. Lows. And um, uh, anyway, the doctor that I went to see uh, diagnosed me and said, how did you build your business without seeking medical help? And I said... You were gifted. I never knew there was anything wrong. Yeah. And in that, in the hypomanic phase, the higher phase, uh, I was hugely creative, um, very full of energy, uh, able to do eight cities in 10 days and... Uh, on the other end of it, I, I would just think, you know, come on, Judy, you can do the East Coast now. You, you know, just mm -hmm. pull, your, pull yourself up and get going. Yeah. And so I never even thought there was anything wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was a lot. And you show how racy you were because you just kept talking and talking. And it was all full of logic, too. I'm an engineer, so I can process that really fast. Mm. Um, <laughs> It's, it's really great. Now, before I let you go, I know you share about the whole Mount Sinai, your, your, your fundraising for the chair, and you truly live through it. Mount Sinai helped you a lot. If there's anyone out there that, I would think there's only a 0.01% of the population that can go through what you go through and still live alive and to share their story. But you've probably seen a lot of people around you, whether high now or normal people, whatever, see a sign, right? How can you tell by that sign and how do you help those people that might be their family member listening to this podcast? How do they identify and how do they help them to get into what you got into at age 41 where you hit that rock bottom? Mm -hmm. How do you let them realize that a bit earlier so they don't have, right. not everyone will be so lucky right. that you never hit anyone mm -hmm. or never roll over, mm -hmm. right? So how do they identify that and how do you how do you like help them? Yeah. From there? So if we're talking about somebody with an addiction or with alcoholism, um, people are in denial um, up to a certain point where what we say is until you've lost enough, you may not recognize that you have a problem. You're that humans, you are right? the problem. You we're know, it humans. isn't it isn't your boss, it isn't your wife, it isn't your kids that the problem is you. And the problem is alcohol or drugs, if that's the particular uh, issue. Um, it doesn't matter what somebody says to you, like a, a, a wife or a boss may accuse you 
of being drunk on the job or being drunk, you know, at home in front of the kids. And if the denial is so great that you think they're the problem, um, you're going to keep on drinking or drugging. And you keep drinking or drugging until you lose your marriage, lose your job, your children won't speak to you anymore, uh, your friends don't want to go out with you because you're toxic when you're drinking. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a, an invisible line which we talk about that one minute I would be fine mm -hmm. and the next minute I'm not fine. Mm -hmm. and, and alcohol is a mood-altering, mind-altering substance as, as are drugs. And so for that individual, um, there has to be a day of reckoning and that day may come when their wife throws them out, their boss fires them, where they've been warned, you, you have to clean up your act, you have to stop drinking, you, you have to uh, change your behavior, that the individual who has the problem won't change until, again, they've lost enough um, that they, they have to look at themselves and say, perhaps that's I'm the right. problem and I need help. And until you're prepared to say, I need help, and you're prepared to listen, mm -hmm. no one else can Nobody help. can help you. Wow. Well, there everyone has it. Speaking from Judy Wells, that actually been there, done that, recover, was very successful in business, and now definitely um, spearheading the whole Mount Sinai uh, chair uh, to have an endowment. Uh, so have they, have, they can have a researcher full time to look into more of these um, uh, more preventive way and how do you guide people correctly instead of just aftermath. Mm -hmm. um, so again, the next um, video that will come out, we're going to in, uh, interview uh, Dr. Buke and this is going to come out right after this video and um, it will go hand in hand with this video. Um, but I really want to thank uh, Judy for coming on and sharing your place with us. It's a really nice place. Um, I just don't hear this kind of stories in real life a lot. Uh, I think more people need to hear this and uh, more me people need to know this, especially after COVID, after all the lockup and all the crazy things happening mm -hmm. around the world. So thanks for sharing. My, my pleasure. Thank you very much for your time as well today, Cody. Yeah. And if you guys want to learn more about it, there's a description, a link. And if you, you know, kind enough, you want to, you can relate, you want to donate again in the link, or you want to know more about what this program is about, check out the link. Okay, see you guys on the next episode. All the links mentioned in this episode are included in the show notes. And if you love this episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple iTunes. The link is also included in the show notes. And we would really appreciate your help in spreading the word to more high income earners on how they too can maximize both their time and money. Also, if you still haven't joined our high income earners Facebook group, you are missing out on high income earners community where we help each other reach our own version of fire.